Hello, my name is Frank Kwan, and welcome to Schools on Point. This half hour, we'll be talking about some of the major issues impacting schools and public education, locally here in Southern California and across the state. With me is Dr. Arturo Delgado, the Los Angeles County Superintendent of Schools. He's the county's chief education official, and through the Los Angeles County Office of Education, serves 80 public school districts that educate 2 million preschool and school-age children. Joining us is State Senator Carol Liu of La Cunata Flint Ridge. Senator Liu is a Democrat representing the 25th Senate District, which includes Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena, La Cunata Flint Ridge, Monrovia, Claremont, Upland, and many of the surrounding cities and communities. She's the chair of the Senate Education Committee and is a member of the Senate Committees on Governance and Finance, Human Services, Public Safety, and Transportation and Housing. Welcome, and with that, let's begin. Uh, Dr. Dugato, let me ask you first. Um, we find ourselves in a strange situation here in California because our budget is actually balanced. And thanks to Proposition 30, um, we look like we may even have some surpluses. In fact, this morning I, I read in the paper that we, the state actually has a bit of a surplus now, which is a very different situation than what we've had before. So from your perspective as a county superintendent, uh, what's your view of California's budget now? It does appear to be some long-awaited good news for all of us, and uh, we're very grateful for that. But uh, the entire educational community is, is, uh, seems to be uh, given a sigh of relief, I think. And, um, but the governor has proposed additional uh, components to this budget for us, and so we're very interested in knowing how this reform uh, that the governor is interested in uh, will end up uh, coming out to us at each district. In particular, we're talking about the uh, LCFF uh, proposal by the governor. And so this formula would provide um, for a seven-year transition to a new system for directing money to schools. And so um, this is a question I'd like to direct to the senator. Uh, senator Liu, uh, local uh, education leaders will have a lot of questions about this. Uh, and the budget overall. So can you tell us more about LCFF? Let me just say that stands for the Local Control Funding Formula. We like to use a lot of acronyms here. Right. Thank you very much for the question. Um, and I applaud the governor. We all applaud the governor for, for um, making some huge steps to trying to clarify, simplify what um, has been going on for decades now regarding education funding. So Local control funding, as it, as it is proposed, is to really return monies back to the districts to let them uh, determine their best needs. Saying that, it eliminates categoricals, and uh, it's also giving additional resources for three different populations that uh, we find are in need, and that's uh, low-income kids, foster kids, and uh, English learners. The intent of the governor's school funding is to really um, make it transparent, make it easier for people, the public, to understand uh, what, where the money is going, et cetera. And we in the legislature applaud him for that because, you know, when I came back to the Senate, there were two things that I wanted to work on. One was um, uh, governance, and he has done that by not appointing a secretary of education, actually. And, uh, to, and he, he is now taking charge of being responsible uh, for education policy in the state, and to the finance system, simplifying the finance system. So, and we applaud the goals. You know, there's been many um, folks writing in recent times about um, it's no longer race, but it is poverty that separates mm -hmm. us. And uh, what do we do about it? How do we equalize it? And, and when I go out and have conversations with my local school districts, we all agree on the goal, bringing everybody along. We don't uh, actually agree on how we get there. You know, and that's part of our responsibility in the legislature is trying to find the way to get where the governor wants to go. And, and uh, so the Senate has introduced uh, SB 69, and it is legislative intent language that does basically three things. Raise, wants to uh, give a base that's adequate. No, don't talk. We can't begin this conversation about adequacy of school funding. But, <laughs> but we're starting that conversation. Yeah. Give, give everybody an equalized base based on you know he talks about uh, 
elementary kids, middle school kids, and high school uh, uh, kids that get varying uh, degrees of money. And, we, and we're in agreement with that. But we like to raise the base, not leave it or not begin it where it is today because it's too low. The other uh, second thing is that he's folding in all the categoricals and then redefining the supplemental grants. Let me interrupt you for a second just to, to make sure that we define categoricals because if you work in education, you know what that means, and if you work in the legislature, you know what that means. But for our audience, what is, what is a categorical Well, program? categoricals were um, special funds set aside for class size reduction, for example. Mm -hmm. um, um, there were money set aside for... Um, Gosh, there were about 40 different kind of, cate quote, categories, gifted funds, uh, money set aside for um, uh, uh, feeding kids in, uh, in kindergarten, and, you know, just many different categories. That are very specific very to spe a purpose. For very specific purposes, right. right. And so he's folded that all in, and he has separated out, let's say, three categories that he wants to address. Those low-income kids those English learner kids who make up over 50% of our population now in California, and uh, foster kids who are, uh, you know, the state of California is the parent of um, our, foster pop our foster children population. And the third thing that the legislature would like to see is some accountability. So if we give you money, we want to make sure that the kids that are in need are really getting the services that we've asked you to perform. That's what, you know, the intent language is of SB 69. And that bill passed out of the um, Senate Education Committee last Wednesday. It was not a bipartisan vote, but all the Democrats voted for it and the, and the Republicans stayed off. Well, let me ask you this then, because not just with SB 69, but with the governor's new look at how he's going to structure, it's, just, uh, it's basically a restructuring of school finance with the budget. Um, this isn't necessarily getting a universally uh, accepted reaction. And in fact, the, the, the governor himself has said that he's pretty aggressive about wanting to make sure that this goes through. Um, how do you see that in, in terms of the legislature? Is it going to move in? Is, is it going to be a protracted discussion? I don't want to say a fight, but is it, is it going to be I controversial? Think, I, I really don't think it uh, will be a fight. I mean, I do think uh, it gives us a place at the table to talk about some of the issues that we're really concerned about that we hear from the field. You know, people want to know exactly what does this mean for me, you know, kind of thing. The governor did do a printout about... Um, um, how much the base amount each school district in the California were going to get. And, and in fact, it's not equal. Some, some districts are getting less than what they currently get. Some districts are getting, quite frankly, a lot more, you know, than they currently get. And so we're trying to um, equalize the playing field and uh, make sure that we do that in investment together as opposed to creating winners and losers, so to speak. The, the um, idea that a district might get less, um, it's, it's been our understanding that the governor's also talked about a hold harmless yes. uh, piece to this. And so districts that um, maybe perhaps are at a particular level um, wouldn't get less, but necessarily the growth within the next seven years may not be realized to the same degree as some others who have, say, Sorry, larger no numbers of kids who are in poverty and, and who right. are English learners. Is that the way that that would work? Yes. So if you want to wait seven years to get up where to where, you know, you think you need to be, you know, that's what the governor proposes. But we, I mean, there's more consensus that um, the base is too low, that we really would like to put more investment into the base and, um, uh, and you know, agree with the governor on the supplemental, giving uh, districts what they need in terms of... Uh, uh, um, the three categories that he wants to concentrate on, but you only get to count those kids once. You can't count them three times. And um, we, you know, we're, we're in agreement. And uh, he did not address accountability, so we want some accountability in it. So, you know, for me, this is a, an opportunity, really an opportunity with the passage of uh, Proposition 30 and with our economy coming back. This is really a, a place to be very careful about what we do to talk about school funding, to get up to adequacy. I hate to use that word because there's not enough money. Right, but right. So this is actually, as you just described it, an opportunity. It as opposed opportunity. to saying necessarily let's go back to doing it the way we've always done it. 
but because of these other factors and, and, and thankfully an improving economy, it gives us an opportunity to look at this again and say, how can we now better design and maybe evolve the system? Is, is this is how you look at it as well? Yes. You know, this conversation has been going on probably prior to my ever even getting into the legislature because when I came in in 2000, those folks before me who really were embedded in uh, education conversation, the D.D. Alberts of the world, the John Vasconcellos, the Jack Scotts, et cetera, we really wanted to change this distribution of monies because it just became so complicated. We couldn't explain why in 30 seconds why it, Beverly Hills was getting X number of dollars and, and Pasadena was getting X number of dollars and what would you base that on, you know, kind of thing. And, and so this way, it's much clearer. We just have to be careful that we don't burden it like the Christmas tree and make, you know, make everybody happy by giving it a, a special uh, ornament, so to speak, you know. So uh, keep it simple, keep it transparent so parents know where their monies are going. And that seems pretty fair to me. You know, funding is such a critical issue here with schools in California and actually across the country. But going with that in terms of high priorities, particularly for parents, is the issue of school safety. And you've been very involved with that. And let me ask Dr. Delgado, because uh, as a veteran superintendent, you know, school safety is such, a, is such a big issue. What's your view on it? Well, I mean, our goal is always to be able to um, turn to any student in our, in our jurisdiction and, and be able to look at them in, in, in the eyes and say, you're, you're going to be perfectly safe with us at all times. Uh, unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. Um, and the recent events uh, you know, throughout the country remind us over and over again that any time anything can happen, so we need to be prepared. Of course, uh, the Los Angeles County Office of Education has uh, collaborated with a good number of community agencies in, in promoting safety. and, and uh, so uh, we help county uh, K-12 schools comply with all the local, state, and federal uh, requirements and, and uh, the types of preparations that each school district needs to be a part of. We, the county office has a major role in trying to make sure that there, all their plans are in place. And so we offer workshops to train um, mental health professionals and other uh, personnel in the recovery process for uh, traumatic school events and, and, and unfortunately we see more and more of those happening. We also hold annual safe schools uh, conferences and to share best practices so that districts are uh, communicating with each other and, and sharing ideas. So it's, it's reassuring that our legislators are, um, have been addressing this issue as well. So um, Senator Liu, uh, what do you think can be done to address school safety concerns uh, at the state and local levels? Well, I would, first of all, thank you for your work. Um, it's great to have a superint county superintendent that uh, uh, is putting school safety out there and trying to help our s school districts um, feel comfortable about, uh, I guess, a changing society. And um, the legislature has heard several bills dealing with this, and we were all concerned about school safety. And given, you know, as you, re you know, referred to some of the tragedies that have gone on across the country. We, there is never going to be a situation where we're all going to be just 100 percent. But um, SB 49 uh, by Senator Ted Lieu uh, requires schools to develop a uh, safety plan procedures um, in response to somebody on campus with a gun, for instance. And um, Senator Price, current Price, um, has his Senate Bill uh, 634 that uh, requires um, schools to conduct specific uh, safety drills and uh, requires the Department of uh, Education to provide a model for comprehensive school safety plans and some training for some state personnel. And then we just heard uh, last Wednesday um, SB 316 by Senator Block that requires that when schools go through modernization that, that um, any room that uh, a, a room that has more than five persons inside of it should have a, um, a safety lock on the door that is locked from the inside as, as well as the outside. So all these things um, people are thinking about, trying to figure out ways where um, we can increase assurance that we're going to be safe, especially for our children. Um, and all these bills are, you know, and more, I guess, on the assembly side. I haven't seen them yet, but they'll come across to me. And, but these, these three bills that I just referred to, they're all waiting um, uh, approval at the Senate Appropriations Committee. So we'll see. 
we'll see what happens, but, but the, that conversation is on everyone's mind. You know, a closely related uh, issue uh, is that of bullying. Uh, it's, it's something that, that seems to just slip through our fingers and we think we're in a position then to really address it, but then new things come up all the time. What, what's, what, what are the difficulties and challenges that the legislature faces in, as it seeks a solution to this, to this issue? Well, you know, it's, it's one, recognizing that it happens. Mm. And some people just deny it. It's not happening in, in my school district. Mm. Uh, I had a particular instance where um, uh, a parent brought his child in to me and he was not getting any satisfaction through the school's principal or the school district uh, about a bullying issue uh, in, in that community. The child, um, actually, he was a, a fifth or sixth grader, created a little video about how he was being bullied. And it was very interesting. And, um, and couldn't get much headway with his own uh, school district. So he came to me and we took on this, uh, as an example, we took this issue on and um, gave, gave, and we had a, um, a workshop dealing with bullying, invited all of our school districts to come and uh, learn about what it is and you know how people behave and um, what can be done about it, et cetera. And in fact, one of my other school districts um, uh, spent, spent a day on campus and all they did was talk about had, uh, bullying and what it is, and the the motto on the you know they paint the kids painted um, banners, putting up on the schools no bullying, stop bullying, that kind of thing. It is an awareness. There are things that we can do to um, bring it to people's attentions and their and their resolutions about treating each other better, you know, um, and to be more aware of. Uh, your own behavior with regards to other people. And in this age where kids tweet and all this kind of Facebooking and all this kind of stuff, it's really, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And we need, and as adults, we do need to, you know, kind of get a handle on it and try to assist folks who are having uh, a difficult time with this. It, it is truly in many ways a challenge because we've seen over and over the effects of bullying. So it's great to see the legislature taking this on and taking a close look at it and seeing if there's some solutions that you can provide. Yeah, we've had, um, in our district, we've had, in my district, we've had a couple suicides, student suicides, you know, and it really is very, very tragic. So um, we need to, we, we as adults need to do a better job. I'd like to talk a bit now about some leadership here because... Um, <laughs> You're the chair of the State Senate Education Committee. That, that's, a, that's a powerful role. It's one that comes with a great deal of responsibility as well. What do you see as uh, what you'd like to achieve as the committee chair and major issues that you see coming up? Well, you know, as I started earlier, you know, the, one of the reasons why I, I ran or re-ran for the Senate, my priorities was uh, fixing the governance system and the other one was the finance, which the governor has really partnered in, in uh, doing the lion's share. It's really great to have a, a partner that understands the importance of education, public education. And, um, you know, it sounds trite, but I really want to, you know, I, I am a former school teacher, so, you know, I really want to restore California uh, to, to the luster that we used to have when I was going to school, and that was a long time ago. But, and I don't know how we came down this path uh, from being, you know, like the fifth in the country to um, the 48th or 49th in terms of uh, uh, support for our students, but that is where we are. And I, I'm not naive to know that there is not enough resources to, um, and we're talking about adequacy, not enough resources to ever get to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. and, and yet our students are moving in a positive manner you know, to uh, be competitive, but there's so much more that we can do and with more resources. There are a couple of issues here for me. Early childhood education has become more important to me, and I'm so glad that the um, President of the United States recognized the value of early childhood education. And the other end, um, uh, you know, we want to, adult education has been uh, bandied about also in this governor's budget. 
that uh, we'd like to take, or I, I took a look at it when I was in the assembly, I'd like to take another look at it as to how we can uh, do a better job being a little bit more efficient and focused on adult education. And uh, lastly, it's uh, about community schools. We don't have resources. Schools don't have the resources to do it alone. And why can't we partner with government, nonprofits, with uh, public health agencies, whatever that community defines as its need, um, to use the school as a community resource, aside from just uh, nine months of the year having kids in the classroom. So, you know, we just need to maximize all of our um, uh, public dollars together to, to really address the needs of our young people and the families that they come from. So, uh, you know, community schools are, are nothing new. It's a strategy. It's not a program. It's just a strategy. And, uh, you know, we have Oakland and Emeryville and Pasadena, where, which I represent, who are going to reach out and, and uh, start thinking about doing something about this. And so in Pasadena, for instance, it's the partnership between the school district and the city of Pasadena. In Oakland, it's Oakland Unified School District and the county of Alameda. So, you know, it's different, different folks get together and, and try to remove some barriers, some silos that they've been working in, and uh, have conversations about our kids, our kids, our families, and trying to um, address the needs of the total body as opposed to working in, you know, I've got this kid in third grade and I'm gonna, you know, just, just do this, you know, regardless of his mental health issues or health issues or, uh, you know, his living in poverty or whatever the, the, the situation may be. So we're trying to look at this more holistically about how we can better affect outcomes uh, and make sure that our resources are used um, really collectively uh, to be more effective. And uh, we hope that this movement, and it's across this country, uh, catches on here. Because we I just don't think that they're going to be more resources coming our way. I mean, I, I, I think when the passage of Prop 30, most people have said, I've done it, right. and uh, you guys figure it out. And it, it really hasn't done it. So, so, so we just need to find ways to, to improve our situation and, and gain the trust back from the public that, yes, we can do a wonderful job. And, um, and so that maybe in seven years they're willing to go to the ballot box again and give us another opportunity to put some more um, resources back in this very, very important uh, responsibility we all have to our public schools. Let me just uh, correct one thing. It's yeah. not trite. Yeah. You have an educational background. Oh, okay. I think, in fact, it, it gives us all quite a bit of confidence that uh, when uh, we get a chance to, to talk to you and, and the work that you're doing now, it gives educators confidence knowing that you, you understand early uh, child uh, yes. education and uh, really um, we, can, we can save ourselves a lot of work right. and heartache in the future right. if we pay a little more attention to, to these kids when they come in uh, really early on. Uh, adult education, of course, is, is, is going to be, I think, um, a real topic of discussion, uh, especially since it's been under the jurisdiction um, primarily of K-12. Right. And I think there's some, some concern as to what happens if it, if it leaves uh, their jurisdiction. Yes. So, so we'll, we'll probably have some more discussions in the future about that. I hope that. so. Yeah. I hope so. But, uh, and you mentioned Prop 30 uh, not being the end all. Most people are familiar with that. And unfortunately, like you, like you stated, they think that, that we're done. But there's another proposition they don't know as much about, and that's uh, Prop 39. Right. And it deals with, uh, you know, the um, how we can upgrade our energy efficiency in our schools. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's it's a, it's a very interesting. Um, Prop 39 closes a corporate t uh, tax loophole, and uh, it that only benefit out-of-state companies. And uh, this initiative uh, really will bring about. $500 million um, this year back into the uh, coffers of the state of California and next year a uh, billion dollars, et cetera. And so right now there is a, um, <laughs> a 
a discussion going on among members as to who's going to make the distribution. What's the? Uh, is it going to be a grant program? Is it, are we going to do this ADA? I mean, it's a, so all the details have not been worked out, and um, uh, hopefully through the next couple of months by June, by the end of June, it will be all be settled out. But the legislature is uh, wrestling with how we. Uh, what we do with this money and, and how we do with it. And so, you know, the governor certainly has ideas. Uh, we're not so sure that we want to um, uh, do this by, he wants to do this by ADA, so or each each number of kids, et cetera. So, you know, that's a discussion that uh, will continue, and uh, you're right. You know, so we we're all feeling a little uh, relief um, that about funding for schools, um, <clears throat> not only through the increase in revenues um, for, for, for Prop 98 and these extra revenues through Prop 39 and Prop 30, and, and we're very grateful for the public for voting for these things. But but um, and, and we're very mindful that um, very mindful that this may be the opportunity to really do something wonderful and not just the same old, same old, to try to move the education agenda forward in a very, very positive way for our kids. You may have already done that, but perhaps, you know, <laughs> as we come to the end of our program, your final thoughts in terms of the education landscape here in California? Is it, is it finally, in a sense, the pendulum swings the other way because it's been so much more on the, uh, almost the deprivation end for the past few years? And now we're sort of feeling that it's there's a there's a change happening, and so how do you see that's going to affect education? Here? I I hope that um, I hope <clears throat> that my colleagues and I are very mindful of the um, confidence that the voters have put into California, the legislature, and the governor in passing Proposition 30. It will over time uh, make up make up about $42 uh, billion whole that was created in the prior administration. And I hope, you know, but at the end result, after 14 years of both the governor, this Governor Brown and Arnold Schwarzenegger, actually, I know this is convoluted, but actually it's a zero-sum game. We will not have really made a dent in terms of adequacy. So. We just need to be very mindful of the bigger picture here. <clears throat> and all of us, you know, keep on chugging along, making it better. But in every decision that we make, um, we have to talk about and be mindful of the kids. That's who we're educating. That's who we're concerned about. That's the future of the state. So um, I just hope that we all hang tight and, and, and not to get too crazy because we see increased revenues because we have, we need to pay you back, we need to pay schools back for all the deferrals and monies we took when you came together to patch up those budgets that we had to live through. There's still work to do. There's much to do. <laughs> well, there's so much more we can talk about, but we've come to the end of our program. This show is brought to you by the Los Angeles County Office of Education, a public agency dedicated to leading educators, supporting students, and serving communities. If you'd like to know more about the Los Angeles County Office of Education, you can visit us online at www.lacoe.edu. For questions, comments, or suggestions, you can also email us at the address that you see on the screen. On behalf of the Los Angeles County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Arturo Delgado, and our special guest, State Senator Carol Liu, I'm Frank Juan. Until our next School's on Point, thank you for joining us.